Have you ever met somebody really, really big? Um, I remember many years ago, Kathy and I drove up to Roanoke to the airport. Um, I think it was Ronald Reagan who was coming in on Air Force One. And we'd never seen a president. And that plane came in for it was some sort of, I don't know what it was even about. It's so long ago, I can hardly remember it. But I remember crowds and everybody looking and, and they come down and they wave uh, the presidents and you say, wow, wow. We have really seen somebody really great. And I know all of you probably have stories of people you've run into, you know, past presidents, movie stars, people that are well known. You say, wow, I saw so-and-so. Wasn't that wonderful? Well, guess what? Jesus was among his own people and they didn't even know who he was. The leaders had no clue. They did not recognize the coming of the Savior. And we're going to see some wonderful words right now. Turn with me in your Bible or on your devices. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he, he was hungry? And those who were with him, how they entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how the on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, here's the key, something greater than the temple is here. And you'd, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Something greater is here. In Israel at this time, in the first century, the Sabbath was really important. It was like a big festival. Every Sabbath was a celebration. They thanked the Lord for his deliverance. They remembered the creation six days on the seventh day. God rested, so we're going to rest. They remember God's covenant, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember, you remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It reminds the Israelites of God's covenant with them and of his creation. And how much more should it be a celebration for us? Because every Sabbath or Sunday, we remember what? We remember the resurrection, the cross of Christ, the focus of all of Scripture, and how the Lord rose up, and how we're going to be celebrating Easter in just a few weeks. So it should be a day of celebration, not only for them, but for us. But Jesus' disciples, we saw, were walking through the field. They were hungry, so they grabbed some grain. You know, it's at the top of the little shafts. And they grabbed some grain and rubbed it between their hands and then popped it in their mouth and ate it. And the Pharisees were incensed. They were just totally beside themselves. And they said, look, your disciples are breaking the law. And then Jesus told them, Two stories, both from the Old Testament that they should have known. The first was about David, and you may remember this, it's in Kings, but David and his men came to a, uh, a tabern the tabernacle. They were hungry, and the priest gave them some of the bread of the presents. They changed it out on every Sabbath, and so the leftover bread, usually the priests eat, but he gave it to David and his men who were hungry. And in the other example, he said, look, the priests on the Sabbath, what do the priests do? They offer sacrifices. That means they have to slaughter animals. They burn them. Then they 
actually some of the sacrifices they're allowed to eat. So they butcher them up, okay? So they're working on the Sabbath. But yet Jesus said they are guiltless because they are doing God's work. They are not guilty and neither are his disciples. And then he lays down this great truth in verse 6. I've underlined this because I have um, skipped over that a lot. I know the Lord of the Sabbath, but something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is saying something really great is here. And you don't see it. You don't even know the words, I desire mercy from a Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You don't recognize the exact same words that Jesus used with Jerusalem. You did as he wept over them as he went in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You did not recognize the time of your coming, the coming of the kingdom of God. You didn't recognize. And if they would have understood these things, they would have known. And then Jesus proclaims, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He created the world. He was the one that rested. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He has control of everything. Oh, how we miss that sometimes. Something great is here. Something greater than the temple is here. I remember a meal we had almost probably a year ago when we were allowed to see people and go out to eat. We had some of our teenagers that we met with, met, and we had a meal together in a pizza restaurant, I won't name. But that's fun, you know, sitting around a table, eating pizzas, talking, playing some games. And then, then we started talking about Faith. We started talking about faith. And some of these young men were really beginning to grow and beginning to want to become believers in Christ. And all of a sudden, in this restaurant that was at that time crowded, you know, people talking in the old days, you know, a year ago, around that table, something greater was there. Jesus was in our midst. Jesus was touching the hearts of some of these young men. And don't you see, this is what happens in all of our lives. When we remember what we are doing here, when we remember who we're worshiping, he will touch us. So when we come into this building, this is not just a building to enter. When we meet our friends and even folks that we just learn about and meet, we're family. We're, and this is a wonderful fellowship here. But this is not just a social gathering. This is just not something we do. People come sometimes out of habit or out of they think I've got to go to church to check my way into heaven. Well, that's not true. We come here because something greater than this building, something greater than us, something greater is here. The creator, the maker of all things in heaven and earth, the giver of life and the forgiver of sins. He is here. The redeemer is here, the sustainer the Deliverer, our Savior. He is here. And that is why we come on Sunday. Because something greater is here. The Lord of the Sabbath, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. So Jesus now is going to demonstrate why he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's going to show the power that he has. And pick up with me, if you will, 
in verse 9, and we're going to go through 14. He went on from there and entered the synagogue. So obviously this was a Sabbath. They were walking through the fields. The guys, his disciples were accused of breaking the Sabbath. And now they entered the synagogue. So it was like he came in this door to our sanctuary. And a man was there with a withered hand. Paralyzed, we don't know how, but just the hand, the lower part of the arm. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him basically setting a trap. He said to them, which of you who has a sheep, if he falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy, just like the other. And the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Instead of celebrating this man who was crippled, whose nerves were healed, and the crippled hand now became just like his good hand. Instead of celebrating the good that was done on the Sabbath, they went out to try and destroy Jesus. So, when Jesus <clears throat> entered that synagogue, he knew they were setting up a test. And he knew that he was going to take care of this very quickly. And so... Because they set him up. Is it, lawful? Is it lawful to heal somebody today because it's the Sabbath? And Jesus, of course, turned the tables on them and said, the sheep in the pit, of course, that's a rhetorical question. You're going to pick up that sheep. In those days, that, that, that sheep was worth a lot of money. You um, got wool from it. If it's female, you got milk from it. But at any rate, they would pull that sheep out of a hole. How much more value is that man who is crippled to be healed? It's an obvious answer. So Jesus showed them, is it right on the Sabbath to do evil, which is what they were going to do? That's what they were doing. And he was laying it out. Is it okay to do evil or is it right to do good on the Sabbath? And he did Good. Their response was to destroy him. We used to have, for those of you who may have a few gray hairs, we used to have a thing called blue laws, B-L-U-E, blue laws in Virginia. Now, those of you that are younger, you don't even know what I'm talking about. This is like a foreign language, okay? So let me say it again, blue laws. I know that sounds weird, but that was their name. And what that meant, while well, most of you are looking at me like I'm a, from another planet, well, I was, I guess, back then, that meant everything was closed on Sundays except gas stations and grocery stores. I think pharmacies. I can't remember. It's been so long. So blue laws were intended to keep people at home on Sunday, go to church, have a meal, and spend Sunday together. Well, those laws now are obviously ancient history as the looks on your face show me, like this is from a foreign world, because now America runs 24-7. I mean, you can do anything on Sunday that you can do the rest of the week, can't you? I mean, there's literally nothing that I can think of that you can't do on Sunday. Even healthcare, even though our offices are closed, we have urgy centers open, you can do anything you want to on Sunday. In fact, I find that kind of sad, and I know we will never return to that, not in this day and age, that will never, ever happen. Because... This country would never have one day a week for a religious observance of Christians um, in our current climate. That would never happen. 
So what do we do? What do we do? In the old days, it was easy. As I said, you couldn't go anywhere. So you went home and had a meal and hung out. But now there are things that you can do, and I'm going to suggest a few things. Now let me be the first to admit, I'll admit it, we have eaten out on Sunday, I've eaten out with many of you on Sunday, and so I'm going to tell you, we do that. So I am a hypocrite, and I'm a sinner, and I've told you a thousand times, I'm the chief of sinners. So we do eat out on Sundays, and yes, I know that makes the cooks and the servers and the restaurant staff work. And one would argue if we go home and eat, then my wife would be working or I would be working some in the kitchen. So we do eat out. But we try not to do much else. Now, occasionally that doesn't, we do break down and go to the store. But what we can do as Christians and what I would exhort us to do as Christians is to say, even though the blue laws are no longer in effect, we as Christians can commit. And this may be something you want to do for Lent. I know we talked about last Sunday, what are we going to give up for Lent and, and, and to remember the cross of Jesus. And maybe you can dedicate your Sundays from now through Easter completely to Jesus. Because what we should do is our faith should, we love him so much, we want to commit every Sunday to be in worship. I mean, when I am not in worship, I feel weird. You know, when I'm on vacation and we're traveling and we don't have time to stop in a church, I just feel really weird because I've been in church every Sunday since I was um, six weeks old. And it's just something that, I really miss. I grieve when I'm not worshiping God. So we can commit every Sunday to the Lord. And more than that, we can maybe go out to eat, but then we can commit when we're out eating that we talk and listen to each other as a family or as friends and talk about things of faith. Maybe talk about something from God's Word that Sunday morning in, in, in preaching. We can commit to have this meal together and focus on a conversation to the Lord. We can also commit to doing other things. I remember when I was a kid, we would frequently go visit, okay? Um, Janice Fry, our, our shut-in. Other people, that, friends and neighbors that you know of that can't get out. Now, it's hard to visit with coronavirus, I admit but we can visit those who need to hear a friendly word. So we can actually do things on Sundays for the Lord. And that's what I'm going to ask us to do, that we will dedicate and commit Sundays, just like the old days, to be dedicated to the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, to this one who is greater than anything here. We want to give him and celebrate every Sunday. The close of this section now tells us who Jesus is in another way. It's really very uh, powerful as we look at this. Verse 15 through 21. Jesus, aware of this, aware of their plans, withdrew from there. And many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make it known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And here we go. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. And you'll remember these words. My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victories. And here's a, ver a word for you. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. My servant, 
with whom I am well pleased. Jesus withdrew. He knew what these guys were doing. They wanted to destroy him. He could have stayed there and, and talked with them more, but he knew he wanted to diffuse the situation. Just like it says, God's word is so clear. He doesn't want, he wants to put out that smoldering wick. He wants to put out that fire. It is not his time for confrontation and his execution. He knows this. So he withdraws, as he has done and will do at other times when the Pharisees want to kill him. Remember, sometimes he just walks right through the crowd. They can't even touch him. But do you remember one of Matthew's great purposes? We talked about this as, we, as we're working our way through Matthew. One of the most important things Matthew does, he pulls the Old Testament forward and puts it right on Jesus. And when he does this, he uses a formula quotation. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So he like shakes you by your lapels. Listen, this is fulfilling what Isaiah said and it's fulfilled in Jesus. Showing that Jesus is the son of David, son of Abraham, son of God. And here he does it in the longest of all his quotations. Isaiah, and the interesting thing, this is in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 42 introduces, this is the first introduction of the suffering servant. You know, in Isaiah 53, 55, there's a number of other quotations of the suffering servant. This is the introduction of this servant. Behold my servant. This is, Jesus, this is Yahweh talking about Jesus. Behold Yahweh's servant. This is God's chosen. My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. You heard those words when he was baptized. This is my son. Behold. And I am well pleased. And then what happened? Dove came down. Holy Spirit. Well, what does God's word say? I will put my spirit upon him. God's words all come together and say the same thing. There are no accidents. This was foretold thousands of years earlier by Isaiah. Okay? And God confirms, this is my servant with whom I am pleased. This is the great one that is greater than the temple. This is the Lord of the Sabbath, my servant. And he will not quarrel. He will not break a bru bruised reed until he brings justice. And in his name, the Gentiles will have hope. <clears throat> right now, a lot of people don't have hope, do they? There are a lot of people that are suffering. They are overwhelmed. Depression, suicide, sky high. For many, many reasons. But one of the main reasons is most of this country does not know God's servant. They have only hope in themselves or what they think will give them security, their 401, their bank account, their home. They hope in material things or their own goodness. And that hope will always fail. But right here, in his name, the Gentiles, that's us, that's us, folks, will have hope. And that hope Never fail. So what do you struggle with right now? What do you struggle with that gives you a feeling of gloom? That gives you a sense of being overwhelmed? All of us struggle with things. And you may be having trouble with finances. You may be having trouble with your health. You may be having trouble with some conflicts in your family. And you feel like you have no hope. Here's your hope. 
this one who is greater than anything in the temple, the Son of Man, who is Lord of the Sabbath. He is our hope. As I close, there's a family who was struggling for hope, and my goodness, we prayed for this family. Literally a year ago, a young man was driving from Richmond to Blacksburg to visit a classmate who was uh, going to Virginia Tech. This young man was going to another university. And on 460, coming west near Lynchburg, apparently a deer ran in front of his car. He swerved, he flipped, crushed the car, head flipped it, and he had a severe brain trauma, flown to Roanoke Memorial. We prayed for this young man. His name was Matt. You may remember that. And he should not have lived. His brain was so severely traumatized. On the score they used, I won't get into all the details, it was almost a zero, which means zero below three is like almost no chance of survival. We prayed for this young man here. He did not die that night. He did not die that week. As a matter of fact, he started moving a little bit, still in a horrible coma. And his family was struggling. There's a place he needed to be called the Shepherd Center, which is in Atlanta, the best center actually probably in the country for spinal injuries and brain trauma, traumatic brain injury. The Shepherd Center, when they first called, um, said, well, we're not sure he qualifies. We'll have to work on this. We'll get back with you. This young man was 19 years old. This family was devastated, but God worked. There was a friend of the grandfather, and she called to see how Matt was doing. And this friend was actually on the board of the Shepherd Center. And this friend worked through the system and the insurance issues, and I won't get into all the details, but this friend called his family, who was struggling for hope, this young man, he's still alive, he might get better if we can get him to a place that can really help. And this friend from Atlanta called and said to this family, uh, quote, don't worry, Matt will be accepted by shepherds by the end of the day. We will accept him. And the paperwork went through. The family in tears got that word. And Matt was flown down to Atlanta into this center, and he was worked on 24-7 uh, as much as these people do a miraculous job. Thank you, Lord. And two months later, Matt was discharged home. He still has a long way to go. He is now speaking. He's moving all of his extremities. He is getting his cognitive function back. He still cannot walk, but he is at home. The only house he ever grew up in. His friends coming to visit him. He smiles, he talks. And this man, young man, when we were praying, there was no hope. In his name, the Gentiles will hope. In his name, we have hope. So I urge you, Remember who we celebrate, someone who is greater than all of us. We celebrate the Lord of the Sabbath, the Son of Man. Something greater is here than we can ever, ever imagine. Commit to be faithful, worshiping here. Commit to set apart your Sunday, to celebrate this Son of Man, and commit to serve the Lord Sunday. Embrace and love this Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath. Pray with me.